This is going to be a weird one, folks, for many reasons. Uh, one of the main ones, Vaughn's not here. Super weird. Um, but look, let's just start the show off with uh, Vaughn got COVID and uh, can't be here. His throat is destroyed, as he put it, uh, which means you just got the biggest of average Josh boys here. I can't believe I just actually named myself that, uh, even though you're not here, Vaughn, but I'm here, baby. We're going to do a solo episode. This is weird because I've never done one of these. Vaughn's done two, I believe, in the context of this show, but here we go. <clears throat> so let's start it out with every one of these episodes I notice. Vaughn likes to start it out with, it's a big Josh boy. I got to tell you a story. And then he goes on this rant about something weird. And he asked me a question about how do you feel about monkeys that are, you know, uh, eating oranges uh, at midnight? And I'm like, Javon, what the fuck are you talking about? So instead of trying to just make this up myself, like I just did, what we're going to do, I played a little bit, played a little game where I uh, decided, all right, let me let me go into a word generator. Let me pick three random words. And I had the random generator give me three words, and I figured I'll come up with a bit or some kind of weird topic that Vaughn would ask me based on those three words. So what did I get? I got crouch, small, and reduction. Now, knowing Vaughn, he's childish. So I figured instead of crouch, let's go with crotch, right? That seems like it. You go crotch, small, and reduction, what do we get? It's a good old-fashioned story about how him, Morgan, his uh, his wife, how they're fighting, and this is how this is how I want to set up the stage. All right, I think that they're they're right now they're trying to trying to potentially you know they're thinking about having a baby one day maybe, and uh, let's say they have this conversation and he comes in and goes, "So, Big Josh boy, I got to talk to you about something that me and Morgan were fighting about yesterday." And he says, "Uh, we were talking about if we had a son, would you?" circumcise the child you know would you give it that the pickle sickle the peen ween the little bit off the top if you will um those are all three things that i assume he would say and then he'd be like so here's my take and i'm sure he has some weird take about how he wants to leave the the baby from not getting the snip snip because Something that, I don't know, some weird kind of ritual that he doesn't believe in or something. I don't know. Vaughn will come up with something weird. We'll hear from him next week on what his actual thoughts are. But what I would say then is, let me tell you from my story, uh, I do plan on eventually having a kid. One of the things we talked about before on this show already is that we're not sure if we want, uh, both of us saying, we're not sure if we want a girl or a boy. Um, if I did get a boy, though, I would definitely give them the old snip snip not me personally that'd be weird but <laughs> i would make someone do it um one because i'm technically half jewish so it's like something that i'm supposed to do i guess but also because man what a what a conversation that would be right like especially if if your child saw it and was like why is my thing different than daddy's you know you can't have that it's just ah uh, that would be so weird then again i don't know how often a kid would see it like i don't remember ever seeing my parents bits so like I don't freaking know, but you got to do it. All right. Uh, stay tuned for Vaughn's answer of his side of the story, because, you know, this was what he told me, but he didn't give me much information. Um, clearly just making that up. Anyway, that's my random bit much quicker because we don't have him bullshitting about something and me getting mad at him for some reason or him making it awkward, even though this was a pretty awkward situation. But let's just dive into it, shall we? Hello and welcome to IndiePod, an indie game podcast, your weekly source for all the indie game news you need to know. And this week, we are bringing you one major news story. And by we, I just mean me. You can clearly tell I'm not the person that usually says this. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be introducing or, or be introduced by Mr. Vaughn Hyde. But unfortunately, he's not here today. He is currently out with COVID, like I said in the intro. But we're wishing him a, a speedy recovery. He seems to be doing okay, but a little on and off. He didn't want to uh, use his vocal cords for this episode because they're destroyed. So instead, you got me, the biggest of average Josh boys. Let me do my little handshake that I do. Now, handshake, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to be watching the YouTubes, all right? The YouTubes. I sound like a very old man. <laughs> you got to be watching the YouTubes. Um, look, these episodes are audio based as most people consume us, but we do have a YouTube channel where we do all of this, uh, not live, but it is recorded. So you can see me moving around. You can see me jiggling and, and juggling, well, not juggling, but maybe one day 
With that being said, uh, we we do want to talk about some housekeeping. I keep saying we. It's weird. It's it's hard to break, you know. Um, but I want to talk about some housekeeping before I get officially started. We do have a developer interview going live. These interviews go live every Wednesday, and we talk to a specific developer who is working on indie games. We talk to a team called Floppy Club. These developers are working on their game called Ritmos or Ritmos. I think was how you pronounced it. Um, it's a really cool puzzle game where you end up creating music based on the puzzle mechanics that are in there. And when you finish it, you uh, do these different levels that turn into this musical masterpiece. Very cool idea. Very cool concept. I definitely recommend it. Both checking it out and checking out the episode comes Wednesday, which uh, for those listening would be February 2nd. Uh, but by the time you're listening to this, if you're a plebe, it's already out. Go check it out. You know the drill. That being said... While you're on your phone, your browser, whatever it is, go check out the IndiePod store that's at Teespring. You could just type in uh, Teespring and then the IndiePod store. We got shirts. We got hoodies. I'm not wearing my hoodie like I usually do, um, but it doesn't matter because you're probably listening to the audio version anyway. But they're super cool. You got to check them out. Um, eventually, Vaughn will make those feed bags we talked about, but it'll probably be another two years by then. And then lastly, uh, let's talk about our uh, reviews. Um if you love us, if you like us, even if you hate us, still give us five stars because uh, why not? Just do it. I don't know why you're listening if you hate us. Um, go to the iTunes, uh, iTunes uh, IndiePod. Super easy to do. Uh, give us five stars. If you're on Spotify, the mobile app, you could do the five stars. You can give it to us. Um, and then for the Patreons, we gotta, we got to name out those Patreons. Give them a little extra love for that $3 tier and above. I don't have a list. So we're going to have to cut this part. Uh, let me write a note. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, he did put the Patreon list at the bottom. Oh, look at you, Vaughn. You're so cute. All right. But I have to actually log into this. Oh, no. Do I have my login? Let's see. It was at 713. I got to cut. Verify this device. That's not what we're looking for. All right. So we're going to put 713 on this just for myself. I'll probably just put this out later uh let's see patreon login attempt it was me it was me vaughn <clears throat> let's see we got nine patrons now that's so impressive i can't believe we have any patrons um all right so the three dollar tier <clears throat> so let's say to eight So that $3 tier or higher, we are hat look, God no. We gotta do that blood oath or whatever the hell uh, Vaughn always says. Uh, we have Ryan, Ethan, a gamer for fun, John. It's just John, baby. Zach Durnham, Chase Hopkins, Philip Renshaw, the Wombat Emperor of Australia, and Sam Fillion from Canada. Thank you. We love you so much. We want to thank all of our listeners, but a special extra thanks to those $3 tier and above patrons. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for keeping us afloat. Now let's dive in to what we've been playing or what I've been playing. I keep using this. We doesn't make sense. So what I've been playing, uh, a lot of games, honestly, I, I play way too many games, uh, just pieces of them, but I wanted to talk about two specifically. Uh, we talked last week and said, nobody saves the world was a good game, not a great game. Um, I still stand by that, but I'm, I'm leaning more towards great now. So I talked a little bit about nobody saves the world by Drinkbox studios. It is a game that recently released came out on game pass as well as, you know, other platforms. If you want, like you can get it on, I believe PC. Um, but I'm playing it specifically on Xbox through the game pass platform. Really fun little game where you have a bunch of different forms that you can become, and it's a little bit of a grind, gaining XP, uh, you're going through uh, this evil force that's taking over the world, and you're trying to figure out who you are, uh, what's going on in this world. Um, I finally finished it, took me about 15 hours or so. I did not complete like 100%. I didn't go for all of the forms. I did a lot of them. I got all of them, but not max level. And then there is a new game plus mode that I might dabble in a little bit later, which kind of adds a difficulty layer of 
making you have to complete every single dungeon that's in the game. I think it's super cool. I don't think I'm going to spend that much time on it right now, but I'll probably jump back into it a little bit later. But after completing it, I will say that I did enjoy the story. I liked some of the turns that they used. I enjoyed the uh, change and and just experience from the characters and kind of building this relationship. Even though it was very, very light, I think what they did was really cool. I still love the grind to it. I, uh, as I finished it, got more and more warm to it. I always thought it was a good, da- good game, but it's looking like, you know, going up a little bit in levels. This is one of those games where I think if you have Game Pass, you definitely got to check it out. I think it's good even just to mess around with. Not a lot of people, I don't think, who are just kind of playing it just to play it will end up sticking in for the 15 hours, but it might hook you like it did me. And you might just want to, you know, see it to the end or constantly keep grinding and get that uh, level up on the different forms and unlock the forms. I think that was probably one of my biggest issues with the game is like it felt really good when you were constantly unlocking forms and constantly getting experience with these different characters. But you kind of hit a wall in the middle of the game where you didn't really level up that much you you had like a few at the bottom tier of of your characters that you were unlocked and then you kind of got stopped based on the story where you had to progress in a certain way and then you'd be able to start unlocking more characters and i felt like it was just a little bit drawn out it would have been nicer if it kind of just let you do your own thing and maybe in the new game plus mode or maybe in like a different version of the game they had it where it was locked behind certain walls of of experience but All in all, I think it was a great experience. I'd recommend people picking it up, especially if you have Game Pass. That being said, that's all I want to talk about it. I beat it. It's good. It's great. You should check it out. The next one that I want to talk about is something that we uh, had a developer interview for, and the developer was nice enough to give me a code of it, and I just wanted to kind of talk about my experience playing a little bit of the game so the next game that i played was velocity noodle and this is by shotgun anaconda Uh, once again we do have a developer interview up so you can check that out as well if you want a bit more in depth on how this game plays out and who the developer is but this is a really cool um very small type of game where the (sighs) The main aspect of this game is you are a delivery person in this futuristic setting where you are delivering noodles. Um, But it's one of those games where, and the developers specifically said, like, it's a video game. They don't always have to make sense. This is just to be fun. Like, you are this individual who has the ability to dash, to double jump, and you also have a samurai sword for some reason. But the samurai sword is really cool because it allows you to throw the sword to targets and teleport to them. So kind of like a dash mechanic, but a little bit more extended. And it's really cool because this game is all around the idea of speed running and the idea of going as fast as you can and trying to play these levels over and over again to get the best time. So I really enjoyed it. It's not my cup of tea when it comes to constant you know, time trials and trying to perfect it. But there's a number of listeners on this podcast that I think would enjoy it. And I still had fun trying to beat the level the first time and trying a couple over and, you know, get that gold medal because there's different times that they suspect you can get based on doing certain little, uh, you know, certain mechanics that help you go faster so you'll notice that if you dash you're constantly running but if you hit a wall you'll stop and you'll have to dash again and you can also keep dashing in between that uh you want to make sure that you're taking a certain route because this uh game could have different ways that you can go so you want to retry these levels to make sure okay what's the fastest way that i can get from point a to point b but it's not even just like a linear sense of you know from one side left to right there's a lot of vert- uh, verticality in this game of you going up and down and through these different like walls that you're bouncing off of there's uh saws that will kill you a whole bunch of stuff i think it's a really cool pickup it's a very uh shorter based uh game i think the developer said it was about three to four hours if i'm not mistaken although you could always check that interview i just don't know off the top of my head i played an hour or two of it just to try out some of the levels i really enjoyed it though i think people should check it out especially if time trial or speed running is your thing there's definitely a community here for it all right so that being said Vaughn doesn't have any games, so we're not going to talk about anything. So what are we going to do? 
we're going to go to our main news. I'm actually really upset that Vaughn's not here because then I, first off, I love this story. This is a super cool, super heartwarming story. And it's about the developers, uh, Hello Games, the ones who created No Man's Sky, which pff, we, I feel like we always have good things to say about this developer. Obviously they kind of shit the bed when it comes to their rollout of No Man's Sky. But this is a super, uh, you know, just everything that they keep doing and continue to do is a testament to how just uh, how great that studio is. But I'll shut up. I'll tell the story. So we're heading over to GameSpot. This is by Jenny Zhang. I hope I said your name wrong. If I, or sorry, I hope I said the name wrong. I hope I said your name right, uh, but probably said it wrong. But it's okay because, you know, if Vaughn was here, he'd also butcher it. So it's all good. Now... They write and say, No Man's Sky devs bring Joe Danger back to iOS thanks to a player's letter. In the article, they write, No Man's Sky dev Hello Games first game, Joe Danger, has returned to iOS systems in a new and remastered form. Previously, due to incompatibility with Apple's evolving operating system guidelines over the years, Joe Danger stopped working on iOS devices. But... Thanks to one person's heartfelt fan mail, Hello Games decided to revive the platform slash racing game. Sean Murray, Hello Games founder, took to Twitter to share the letter they received from the parent of a child with autism. The writer told the studio how important Joe Danger was to their kid, stating Joe Danger has allowed Jack to interact and have fun with friends and family alike. As a parent, it's hard to put into words the feeling I get seeing the pure joy on Jack's face. Not only has Joe Danger helped Jack with friends, but it has become an important coping mechanism for him. They continued and concluded the letter by asking the devs if there was any way to get Joe Danger working on Apple's newer operating systems. Now this is, so let's just, before I keep reading, uh, this is an interesting sentiment because there's a lot of times, or I know even I will send something out and it's just kind of a shot in the dark. You know, this is one of those things where the developers behind No Man's Sky, they've they've got a lot going on, right? They're constantly creating uh, different DLC and releases for, for this game. They're always working on something. So it's really easy for something like this to slip through the cracks or for them to just say, we don't have time for that. However, we're continuing the article. The letter struck a chord with Hello Games, with Murray stating, this mail broke our hearts and made us want to set things right. The studio ended up spending time remastering the Joe, uh, Joe Danger games, and the resultant resultant, and the resultant new updates are free to download for existing owners. For those who don't own the Joe Danger games, the remastered action pack, which includes Joe Danger and Joe Danger Infinity, costs around three dollars. Which is super crazy. That's awesome. Like it's great for those who already had it. It's not an unreasonable price for those who don't. Um, but Murray also recounted, this is continuing the story, Murray also recounted the studio's history, noting that while No Man's Skies uh, made Hello Games famous, Joe Danger is where they got their start, and they're proud to give Joe the happy life he deserves. That's in quotes. The remastered version of Joe Danger has higher res graphics, better frame rates, and pro motion, as well as gamepad support, which that's uh, all great things, right? Um this is one of those stories where I, I particularly, I do not know anything about Joe Danger. I did not play this before. I don't know that I'm going to play it now because it's just not a game that really appeals to me. Um, I'm not really much of a mobile player in general, which most people know. But that being said, I don't think this would be the type of game I'd want to even, you know, if I needed a mobile game. But that being said, this is so helpful to one individual. This is a studio who, and, you know, obviously not every studio can do this because Hello Games is in a better place with the the popularity and, you know, the the constant stream of, uh, of revenue from No Man's Sky that they would get. But that being said, they also definitely didn't have to do this, right? This is a, a huge ask from this individual saying like, hey, you're no longer working on this game, but like you could really help out an individual. You could help out my son. You would make me very happy. And that's the kind of publicity, which first off, it's like part of it is, yeah, you're being a good Samaritan, but like also just making Hello Games look 
super good because how do you like how do you hate them after something like that this is the kind of thing where i've even seen in some of the comments of this article where people said something to the nature of like i now you know back this developer because of just the good qualities that they have rather than even just the games right like uh, I really wish Vaughn was on about this just so we could kind of gush uh, about this team and kind of what they've done. I think it's definitely interesting um, as far as like how it helps individuals and what the the new change to this game really meant. Like I wish, I wish this would have been, I don't know when, let me see. I don't know if they show when, I'm looking through the Twitter thread right now, if they show when this came in. Because I'd love to know kind of like how much work really went into this, right? Like they did update a good amount. So is this something that this project took them a good amount of time? Like what really went into this from a work perspective? Granted, that's not, you know, uh, that important. What's important is they came out and said, hey, we're going to do it. And they delivered. Um, but just an interesting tidbit that I'd love to see uh, as well as down the road, I'd love to see if this type of story kind of catches fire to this game, right? Will people end up saying like, it might not be for me, but like, I respect the developers. Cause I know there's people out there who do that. And that's not always the case, but like, if you like this series or if you like this developer, sometimes people will just get it right. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's super cool. I don't know that I have that much more to say, but, uh, hello games, just doing good stuff, you know? That's how it works. All right, so that is our main news story. I know that was uh, just one, but I think it's a big story. I think it's worth talking about. And I'm also going to gush a little bit on our stuff in Newscram. Do you know Newscram? I don't have someone to, to cram for me. So you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to pretend I'm Vaughn. Cram! That's my best Vaughn impersonation. Thank you very much. News Cram is our weekly wrap-up segment where we, the hosts of IndiePod and Indie Games Podcast, cram you full of all sorts of indie game news. This week in News Cram, we have two main News Cram news stories. And one of them, well, actually both of these, I'm kind of interested in. Uh, the first one we have over on uh, Twinfinite, where it's reported that Yacht Club Games just announced that the third Yacht Club game, ugh, I cannot talk. Got that Vaughn inspiration in me. That third Yacht Club Games Presents will be aired on G4's Twitch channel. I think this is interesting in a number for a number of reasons. One, I thought that they did this just on their own through their own YouTube channel. I think it's weird that they're like pairing, like partnering up with G4, but I guess it's more for kind of expanding into different audiences. So I can get that. And also they're might be a little bit of hype with it being like a live thing. They might do some kind of demos or interviews throughout the, the G4, um, presentation, you know, on that specific platform. Um, but the big news here is they're going to be possibly creating shovel Knight two or whatever that might look like. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's interesting because we've already had a number of spinoff games that have come from shovel Knight and, uh, for the most part, they've done relatively well. I've seen like the, the most recent one was the, uh, I think it was like Shovel Knight Dig, uh, is, is the name of it. And it was that more puzzle type game. I think I, I saw a lot of eights out of 10 across the board, which is pretty good. I still haven't had a chance to pick it up, but it definitely is one that it looks interesting to me. Um, but if they do something like a Shovel Knight two, they're going to get a lot of hype because there's so many people who love this game and it had so much content to it. So I'm, I'm very interested. My, my main thing with this though, is like, I don't know that they, they will, because they're taking a lot of branches where the team is creating, you know, all those Shovel Knight spin spinoffs. And they, they even gave the spinoff to a different developer and they were just publishing it. Whereas they also had Cyber Shadow that they published. Um, I, I forget the the name of the dev at the moment right now, um, but they, you know, Yacht Club was the ones who helped publish that rather than actually develop it. So I'm interested to see if they want to take a step away from, you know, mainlining Shovel Knight because they've been doing this for a long time, right? Like, is is this going to be the next Shovel Knight or are people just kind of getting ahead of themselves? Um, 
Looking through a blog post highlights, we can't wait to unleash everything we've been cooking up since our last showcase in February 2020. Uh, it's been difficult to keep all this cool stuff a secret. We hope you tune in and get excited too, because this is just the beginning. So this could be anything, right? We don't know what it is. They've been working on this since February, which uh, that's, wow, 2020, that's almost exactly two years. It'll be exactly two years by the time this goes live, which is... Uh, I don't know. It could be the next Shovel Knight. It could be something completely different. I think the main thing here is like everything that's come from the studio has been, for the most part, either highly successful or still uh, relatively well received. So there's a lot of my whole attitude about like if it's good, if it's from a good developer or a well trusted developer, like it'll probably be good no matter what. Um, but I can see a lot of people who, if this doesn't show Shovel Knight 2, will give you the uh, internet troll uh, rage from people in the chat. But I'm excited to see what it is, no matter what. I think I'll play it. I'd be more than happy with a Shovel Knight 2 because I, I was a big fan of that game. Uh, but if it's something completely different, I think, you know what, Yako Games, they know what they're doing. I'm interested to see it. Our next news story over on, uh, let's see, we have this as well, I believe, on Twinfinite. Uh, yep, over on Twinfinite. We have reports that Skull the Hero Slayer surpasses 1 million copies sold, which is nuts. That's actually a lot. So Skull, uh, I played uh, whew, uh, a while back when it first released, and I had uh, a lot of fun with it. But I, I did not think that they would do this well. Granted, I mean, it was a good game. It reminded me, strangely, a lot of uh, a roguelite version of MapleStory, which I was a big fan of MapleStory. I just love that style and that artwork. It's very cutesy, but also it was very, you know, dark. And it had that theme where you're literally a skeleton just throwing your head. Um, but it, it was a fun game. So I don't think that it's not... Uh, possible but i am still surprised but congrats to the team uh to southpaw games good job uh let's see we got to go now on to some new deals and quick steals in news cram and our first and only deal of this week comes by the way of let's see uh nobody that's right i'm just reading shit and there's not a deal here. I just punked y'all. But there actually is the Lunar Sale over on Steam. Let's do a quick check though, because I think the Lunar Sale ends on February 3rd. And what that means is, whew, that means plebs don't get any loving. It always seems to be the case. I'm sorry, plebs. Uh, you get nothing. But if you were a patron, you'd know that the Lunar Sale is happening and that you could get a bunch of deals on Steam. So sorry, plebs. You got to give us a dollar so you can save money, I guess. What are you going to do? Anyway, actual stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about new stuff in News Cram. Our first seven items in new stuff comes, by the way, of Nintendo Life, where it's reported that puzzle platformer Pom Pom by Tomo Camp is headed to the Nintendo Switch and PC via Steam sometime later this year. That point-and-click adventure game Prim uh, Primordia by Wormwood Studios is heading to the Nintendo Switch on March 2nd. That Zagreus from the uber popular roguelite game Hades is going to be immortalized as a nin droid uh nen droid figure I don't know how to say it I don't know much about it. it just looks like a one of those pop uh whatever type looking little doll things toy action figure with a big head but looks super cool though I I will admit I do like this one uh then again I'm a big Hades fan so what are you gonna do uh pre-orders going live at the time of this recording through good smiles online shop so if you're listening to this and you want one of these go to good smiles online shop that 2D action platformer Death's Gambit by White Rabbit is getting more DLC content. This one titled Ashes of Vados, which will release sometime in the spring and is said to include a brand new boss encounter, a new arena, and much more. Don't know what much more means, but get excited. That roguelite action game Samurai Bringer by Alpha Wing Inc. is heading to the Nintendo Switch and PC via Steam sometime this spring. That first-person shooter, Severed Steel, by Greylock Studio, just received some new content on PC, mainly 12 new levels, 4 new weapons, and a new arm cannon, as well as much more. I don't know what that arm cannon is, but sounds cool. 
And lastly, that adventure game, A Memoir Blue by Cloisters Interactive, has been delayed to March 24th. All right. Uh, let's see. Any more in here? It looks like we've got a few more on Twinfinite as well, where it's reported that the top-down 2D Battle Royale game, Super Animal Royale by Pixely? Pixile? Pixile, maybe? I like Pixile better than Pixely, but I don't know how uh, to pronounce it exactly. But Pixile, Pix, Pixile, <laughs> I keep changing their name, is hosting a new event titled Year of the Super Tiger, which will take place from January 25th to February 15th. As well as that action platformer Sword and Bones by Seep, that's S-E-E-P, is heading to the Nintendo Switch sometime later this year. And to round the group uh, uh, out over on GameSpot, it's reported that the free-to-play Brawler Royale game Rumbleverse by Iron Galaxy has been delayed yet... has been delayed, yet no new release date was given. Oh no. I read that wrong, and uh, then I made it sound much more dramatic than it needed to be, but... Basically, it's delayed, and who knows when it'll come out. Hopefully, sometime soon, but we'll keep you posted when we find out. Now, normally, this is where Vaughn would say, Josh, we've been blessed with so many amazing indie game news stories, which we have. Uh, just a little strange that it's only me talking, but because we've been blessed with so many of them, do you all know what time it is? It's time for the indie shout out. Now, for those who don't know what the indie shout out is, this is something new we just started. This is where instead of doing the God Bless the Crowd segment that we used to, uh, where we went to Kickstarter and found a game and talked all about it and why you should back it or not. Uh, now we decided to do indie shout out where Vaughn and I are both separately picking one, which in this case, it's just me. Uh, one being an indie game and decide to talk about it and let people know, hey, there's a game. It might be out, it might not be out, but it's a cool indie game that you should follow or just check out, if it sounds interesting to you, that is. Now, even though I just gave that whole speech about how we walked away from Kickstarter and God bless the crowd, I found this game actually in Kickstarter. Uh, and if you're listening to this, this is the last day that, uh, and I'm talking about for plebes, this is the last day that it should be available to back on Kickstarter. So if it's something that's interesting to you, I'd check it out. I'm not going to go through the whole rigmarole of how much it costs or whatnot, blah, blah, blah. But I just thought this game was really cool and that I wanted to talk about it. So this is called Forward Escape the Fold. It's a roguelike dungeon crawler with a very minimalist card form of combat and exploration. So it reminds me a lot of Ring of Pain in the idea that you're not necessarily playing cards, like, you know, in Slay the Spire or a, a game similar, you have a deck of cards and you you shuffle through that and you get to play it based on certain attacks or defense. Well, that's not the case. Instead, picture uh, the way the game is, is uh, the whole like visual aspect of this game is you have kind of a table that you're looking at and a bunch of cards that are just laid out in uh, a giant, you know, for as long as you can see, it goes constantly from right where your character card is that you selected to the top of the screen. And there are a number of cards that are then in between there. And what you're doing is kind of just following up that trail of cards and you're selecting where you want to go based on that. So do you want to, you know, find some items? Do you want to attack these monsters? Do you want to grab this loot? Whatever it is. Um, and you're playing out a scenario based on the cards that are in front of you, but not cards that you actually have to play. So that's why I say it's it's much more like a roguelike dungeon crawler where you are this character trying to fend your way through a dungeon. The only difference is that means of, of transportation or that means of exploration is through these cards that you're then choosing to either attack an enemy or to go a certain direction in the dungeon. Um, if that sounds interesting to you, which it should if you like Ring of Pain. Uh, you can check them out over on Twitter. The, it, this is a solo dev, by the way. Their Twitter handle is at two, that's two, the number two spelled out, T-W-O, tiny dice. So that's two tiny dice. They also have a Steam page that you can find from the Twitter. And like I said, there is a Kickstarter, which you can also find from that Twitter page. Uh, that's probably the easiest way you can get to all of those different links to check that out if you find it interesting. I think it's like $12 to, to back the Kickstarter. But that being said, uh, we're not here to pressure you one way or another. Just check it out. And uh, if it looks interesting, 
at the very least, follow their Twitter account or wishlist their uh, their game on Steam. All right. Well, now that we did the indie shout out, I think it's time we move on to listener questions. Now, I know for those listening or for those asking, uh, you probably want something from Vaughn when you ask these questions. So we'll make sure to have his side of the story when he comes back, especially because I think some of these are pretty good and he would have quite an opinion on. That being said, moving on to our audience questions, our listener questions, we first start off with Ryan. And uh, this is an interesting one. Ryan writes, what is your great greatest uncommon fear? And they wrote, for example, I fear of walking in the dark in the countryside and stepping on a hedgehog. Not because it would hurt, I'm actually scared of killing him. It's very nice of you. I don't want to kill a hedgehog either. Um, I I think that is a very uncommon fear. I don't know many people, but also I don't live anywhere in the countryside, so I would never picture myself stepping on a hedgehog. I'd have much more of a chance of stepping on an alligator here uh, or a crocodile. I don't know, whatever. Some type of creature that would eat me. That being said, my most uncommon fear, this is kind of a weird one. It's not really a fear per se, but it is something that happens to me and makes me feel uncomfortable whenever I see open wounds. So you could say I'm afraid of open wounds, not in the sense of like, I'm going to be upset or like scared and run away from them. But, and I don't know, this is kind of one of those things where if anyone else experiences this, I'd love to hear it because I've told this story a number of times to different people and no one seems to have the same experience as I do. But I have the weirdest reaction to seeing open wounds or cuts or things that happen that make me kind of like not feel okay. Most people will sometimes, well, not most people, but some people will get an initial body reaction when they see something like that. They'll kind of like jump back or they'll tense up. Uh, I get that, but I get it in my butthole. I get a sharp pain <laughs> that just stabs me right in the butt whenever I see an open wound. I don't know why. I just know that it's the reason why I could never be a doctor. And I hate it. And I, I just do not like it. So it's not really a fear per se, but I am very uncomfortable when I see those type of things. So it's something that I fear going through if I see an open wound. <laughs> So that's mine. Uh, it's super uncommon because I've never heard anyone else have the same issue, but that's me, baby. Good old butthole pain. Uh, anyway, moving on to our second uh, listener question, which comes from Phil. Uh, and they write in and say, so how close of a family member is too close? If you get what I'm laying down here. Our second cousin's fair game, for example. Phil, stop writing these questions. I don't want to answer this. I think, yes, it's too close. Too close, too close, too close. It's too much. Now, I know Vaughn is going to be like the other way. We've had a conversation about this. I don't want to talk about it. Um, I'd say second cousins, maybe. I don't fucking know. I, it's still too much for me, man. If I found out something like that, I'd be like, even if, you know, like if I found out, oh man, I don't know. If I found out today that that was the situation with my wife, I don't know. I, instant divorce. You know what I'm saying? Instant divorce. Uh, but Vaughn, maybe, maybe different. We'll have to find out. Um, then Phil writes in. So these ones, uh, these next two are more for me, which I think makes sense since Vaughn's not here. Uh, so biggest of average Josh boys, what is the most awkward question you've had to answer on this podcast? Phil, that is a great question. I don't, there's a lot of awkward questions that you ask of me. Um, and I usually do the same thing that I did with the last one where I don't, it's not that they're like, I don't know, because the most awkward, I don't really care as much with these questions because it's like, it's one of those things where if it was coming from me and I was bringing up these topics, it'd be one thing, but it's like, these people are just asking me, right? So it's like, it's not that awkward. I guess like the mom and dad having sex one was kind of weird and would probably be the one that totes the line of like, the way I, I think of it is if I had someone from work or a family member listen to this podcast, I'd be like, yeah, don't listen to that part because that's fucking weird. But then again, that's a lot of these questions. I just don't care as much anymore, although I don't constantly advertise this podcast to people in my real world world life. Um, 
I think one of the weirdest ones that kind of made me feel awkward was uh, actually, I think the first question you ever wrote into before we really had a community, before we started the Patreon, before we started the Discord, you wrote in a long time ago to our email, uh, which for those who don't know is IndianCursionPodcast at gmail.com. That's how you can send in these questions. I don't even say that, but that's how you could do it. Or you can hop on into our Discord or on the Twitter posts that we post all the time. Lots of different ways. Anyway, you emailed us a long time ago and you wrote in about how much money uh, it would take. So how much money it would take someone paying us to eat an actual turd. And the reason why I mention this is one of the most awkward ones, even though it's kind of tame because it's whatever. Um, it was just at a weird time where I had just started my new job, which is the current job I'm at now. Uh, and my team was asking me about what I do. And I mentioned the podcast and they were like, Oh, that's so cool. And they were like asking about it and I was explaining it. And I said, yeah, it's, it's about indie games. And, uh, it's, you know, for the most part about games, but then, we kind of veer off when we get into the listener questions, which people ask us whatever they want. And they were like, oh, well, what's the weirdest question you've gotten? And it was like right after that episode. And I was like, well, the weirdest one. And then I told them that. And they all kind of were like, yeah, we're done with this conversation. <laughs> so you know what? I'm going to use that one because you kind of made all of my coworkers uncomfortable. But fuck it, I guess, you know? And then the last question that Phil writes in, and our last question of the day, uh, Phil writes in and says, I was there at the dawn of Steam, eagerly awaiting for Half-Life 2 to unlock, only to be plagued by issues as the servers got overwhelmed. Needless to say, I was not happy with not being able to buy the game on DVD and just being able to play the damn thing. Do you remember your initial reactions to Steam? It's a good question. Uh, I don't think Vaughn's going to have... Uh, he'll ans his answer will be very similar to mine, even though I came into the PC gaming world earlier than he did. I came into Steam right after the 360. I didn't really dabble with PC much other than, you know, the older, like, uh, Blizzard games, like your Diablos and your your uh, Warcrafts and, and Starcrafts. But for the most part, I never was really there for Steam until they kind of got most of the kinks right. Granted, Steam still goes down. There's still issues all the time, specifically even with, you know, like with Xbox and with consoles. Like just the other day, I wanted to start Nobody Saves the World because it had just released that day that I wanted to play and the servers were down. So for an hour, I literally didn't, I just kind of sat there and I was like, I hope they come back eventually. Uh, luckily, they. I started playing only you know, an hour before the servers ended up getting fixed, but they were pretty much down off and on again for that whole day. So I think what your main question really is, is like, is there an issue with us going away from physical goods because situations like this happen? You know, the internet goes down, the, the servers go down. We're kind of just like, we're just screwed, right? And I definitely will agree with that. Uh, to a degree, because I just don't want physical goodies. I'll take the, I mean, I'll be pissed, right? I was still mad, but uh, I'll take the fact that I don't have to, <laughs> it's going to sound real dumb and real lazy, but I don't have to stand up and change those discs. I don't want to do it. I want to press a button and I want it to play. Whether it means it gives me a not connected to the internet message for an hour and pisses me off, uh, but at least I didn't have to stand up. You know what I'm saying? So I think... That's really, you know, that's, it's, it's a good enough, uh, exchange. I don't have to get up, but sometimes internet sucks. That being said, uh, with steam, like I said, I, uh, I wasn't there for it for the early days. I was there a little bit later. I'm still there now. I'm definitely more of a PC junkie as of these days, but back when I was a little bitty baby, not really, because I was a teenager, but back then I didn't know shit about games or about PC games because I was just, I was a big dum-dum. I didn't know how to put together the adult Legos. But that's about all we have for today. That's the end of this episode. I want to thank everyone who listened, who's actually still here, because I know this was a weird one. I think I still did an okay job explaining the stories, explaining uh, my side of the story and answering these questions. So 
If you liked what you heard, remember to go rate us over on iTunes. Don't only take this episode, though, if you didn't like it, because we've got others that have a bunch of other stuff, and they're probably better. Anyway, uh, but thank you for those listening. Vaughn will be back hopefully next week. Once again, we're wishing him a speedy recovery, and that COVID does not uh, destroy his voice any more than it already has. Uh, But with that, have a great week, y'all. We'll see you next time. Bye.